Hi everybody. Welcome to how to use business tax returns and divorce. This is a webinar for attorneys and law firms. My name is Josh Horn, CPA, and I'm of Horn Valuation, and I greatly appreciate your time today. Thank you for coming. Do you want a clear, effective, and proven way to understand how a business tax return impacts your case, a roadmap to determine business income and value, and an easier way to settle cases when a business is one of the primary assets, then you're in the right place. What will this mean for you? If you are afraid of losing money for your clients, making mistakes, being surprised, or even getting embarrassed, let's get rid of this today. That's what we're gonna do together. My story, I promise I'll keep it short. Here's me with my lightsaber and my Dukes of Hazard pajamas. And I show you this photo for two reasons. One, it's clear that Hollywood is not coming up with too many original storylines, even three decades later. And secondly, this is about the time I started to develop an interest in math and what would later become accounting. One of my earliest memories, even earlier than this, was counting pennies and putting them on the floor of my bedroom in hundred penny piles. Remember the 80s. This is me with my mother and father, sister and grandfather. Of course, I'm the one in the middle. Unfortunately, this family didn't stay together. My mother and father divorced when I was about 10 years old. And I say that not for sympathy, but because I understand some of the stress that you divorce attorneys are under. I understand the difficulties of the family dynamics. And it's hard. Your job is difficult. And I understand parts of that. Taking a negative and putting a positive spin on it, I don't think I would be the person I am today had I not gone through that struggle. I think it made me a tougher kid. And... I don't think I'd be talking to you today if it weren't for that experience. My education path, that's not my high school, that's a stock photo. I worked a lot in high school. I worked some of college that helped put me through college. Got into the number one accounting program at the University of Illinois, I'm real proud of that. And worked for a year and then took the CPA exam and passed that on the first try. My professional path stops in a few places like many of you out there. This is my 21st year of working. 15 of those years were spent in tax work consulting for businesses and business valuation. Two of those years were in my business, Horn Valuation, where I helped divorce attorneys and litigation attorneys with valuation and income issues. The rest of that time I was in the corporate accounting world. The key thing I want to stress here is this was not all glamorous, like many of our jobs. No, it's, it's about hard work and what we learn along the way. And the thing that I developed during all these places I was at was a unique ability to clean up a lot of messes. And I volunteered a lot for the jobs nobody wanted. I worked very well on the abstract, messy records, poor accounting, you name it. I got real good at this to the point where if this kind of thing came into an office or it was the project that needed to be done, I did it. And I did it well. About 10 years ago, I got a kick in the head. I went out and got a business valuation certification. Worked really hard at it. My first one was a CVA. This was a very humbling experience for me because up to this point, I'd done a lot of tax work and after obtaining the certification, I figured out, wow, these tax returns really aren't telling us much, are they? And so I never looked at a business the same after that time period. The good news is for you is that valuation theory works very well 
with what you do as divorce attorneys because we're trying to figure out cash generated by a business which can get us to value of that business. In the tax world, it's all about complying with the IRS, complying with the Internal Revenue Code. So that does not work very well in its raw form. And we're going to get into this deeper in a minute. So I counseled every client differently after I obtained the CVA and then later the ABV. So in the alphabet soup world, the CVA is from the NACVA and the ABV is from the AICPA. So this changed my whole view of the world and it was an important stepping stone in my career. My very particular set of skills, I've been a CPA almost 20 years, 21 years working. I've worked with the businesses from the mom and pops to an international company. I have a strong tax background, two business valuation credentials. I work very well with the poor records. I can help you find the holes in the tax returns. And this is key. I've learned that tax returns are useless in divorce without adjustment. I'm going to prove that to you today. Then we're going to learn how to fix it. If you only get one thing from this presentation today, this is it. Understand that a tax return is a single purpose document. It's for the IRS. It's not for us. The IRS doesn't care what we need we have a different problem to solve. A better place to start is typically a financial statement prepared by a CPA, either audited, reviewed, or compiled. However, a lot of financial statements are prepared on the tax basis. So they're just like the tax return. Essentially not going to get you where you need to go. And financial statements still very often do not give you cash generated by the business and the fair market value of the business's assets. It's not going to give you either one of those things. It's designed to serve a purpose with the IRS and that's not our purpose. You may be stuck, however, because the tax return may be the only document that your client is required to have or the opposing side in your case. A lot of businesses aren't required to have financial statements, so you may only have a tax return. This can cause a situation where the, your entire case hangs on the tax return and it won't give you what you need. It's all you have. You could lose money or assets for your client because it's confusing and it doesn't give you what you need. You could lose your case, financially anyway. This is really truly an uh-oh moment. What should you do? Houston, we have a problem, as Tom Hanks said. Well, I guess that was Jim Lovell. Paul 13, one of my favorite movies. We have a square peg and a round hole problem. It is fixable if you know where to look and what to do. I'm going to show you what to do. Now, just to keep you awake out there and keep things fresh, and I'm going to show you this video to drive home what the square peg and a round hole issue is about. Would you? We have a situation brewing with the carbon dioxide. We had a CO2 filter problem on the lunar module. Five filters on the limb. Which were meant for two guys for a day and a half. So I told the doctor. They're already here. up to eight on the gauges. Anything over 15 and you get impaired judgment, blackouts, the beginnings of brain asphyxia. What about the scrubbers on the command module? They take square cartridges. And the ones on the limb are round. <laughs> Tell me this isn't a government operation. It just isn't a contingency we've remotely looked at. Those CO2 levels are going to be getting toxic. Well, I suggest you gentlemen invent a way to put a square peg in a round hole. Rapidly. Okay, people, listen up. People upstairs, candidate.
just this one, and we gotta come through. We gotta find a way to make this fit into the hole for this, using nothing but that. Let's get it organized. Okay, okay, let's build a filter. Maybe get some coffee going too. So that's our square peg in a round hole problem as demonstrated by Apollo 13. Let's fix this. What we're going to do together, we're going to review a very common tax return, the S Corp return, which is filed on form 1120S. Our S Corp is called ABC Company. 1120S is called a flow through entity, the profit or loss from the business flows through to the individuals and then they pay taxes on their 1040 individual tax returns. You likely have or have had a lot of clients in flow through businesses either an 1120S or a 1065 which is a partnership. Most of what I'm going to show you can be applied to multiple tax returns including the 1120 which is a C Corp, a 1065 partnership a Schedule C business, which is filed on the Form 1040, and a Schedule F, which is a farm schedule filed on the 1040. We're going to use ABC Company to generate client income and value. So income generated by the business and the value of the business. Those are two separate concepts. The return looks like many I've seen, and you've probably seen many like this too. As we review it, I'm going to teach you about the seven red flags. You're going to learn how to find the seven red flags and then quantify them and apply them to your case. At the end, we're going to quantify the total impact of the red flags on income and value. You're going to be amazed by the impact. And more importantly, you're going to have a big advantage over your competitors in your cases. One thing I want to point out here, with ABC Company, we are operating under the assumption that ABC Company has reported all of its gross income. It's not a gross income fraud. You're still going to see a huge change from beginning to end of this process. Do you know the seven red flags of business tax returns? They are business losses, losses generated by the business on a tax return, personal expenses, depreciation greater than CapEx, which is capital expenditures. We're going to define this later. Loans to shareholders, compensation distributions and dividends, inventory that's misstated, and excess or appreciating assets. I see one or more of these on every tax return I see. They generally fall into one of four categories. Quirks, and those are simply things in the tax code that don't translate well into the world that you live in as an attorney. So a specific internal revenue provision that doesn't translate very well and causes a quirk between that world and the world you live in. Sloppiness, which can be sloppiness from the business owner or from the accountant or CPA in preparing the tax return. Gray areas in the tax law, areas that are subject to interpretation, those are gray areas. And then flat out fraud, it can be fraud. Business losses, what's really going on in this tax return? You have tax losses and you have cash losses. You care about cash. A business can't generate real and repeated losses of cash unless more capital is put in the business or more debt is added to it. So you need to ask yourself two key questions when you see a business loss, particularly a multi-year loss. So you have five years of tax returns or whatever and you see losses in repeated years sustained or certainly more losses than gains more losses than profits ask yourself 
is the business worth more alive than dead? And how you find this out is, is it supporting a family? And is it doing it without adding more debt or capital? Capital being cash put in by the owners. If it's worth more alive than dead, how much cash is going in the owner's pocket? That will really help you determine how to go forward. This is what a loss might look like on an 1120S, an S-Corp return. There's negative $20,000. Here's a Schedule C with a negative $20,000. That's what that might look like. These are just examples. Here's a Schedule F farm with negative $50,000. To avoid a nonsensical tax return, ABC Company is not going to start out with a loss. We're going to make it past certain tests and start with a small income of $5,000. So that this could be a return that could actually land on your desk and would have passed muster with the IRS. So we're not going to make this a ridiculous return to start out with. You should still be aware of losses and particularly multi-year losses. Just because you don't see a nonsense return today doesn't mean you won't see one in real life. You probably have, you probably will. So keep your eyes open for multi-year losses that can't be substantiated by the things we talk about today. So our ABC company is going to start with a small profit of $5,000. That's where we're going to start with this before we start making adjustments. Personal expenses. Nobody's seen these before, right? They do happen. I don't go into these situations assuming they're there, but they do occur and they occur fairly frequently. Suspects can be all over the board and that's one of the difficulties here. They can be in travel, payments to related parties as in family members, automobile expense, depreciation, assets that are, that are on the books that are personal like snowmobiles and personal vehicles. Your gut may tell you they're there, but detailed analysis is going to carry the day. So things you can request to find personal expenses include general ledger account detail. So that's the detail behind the accounts in the bookkeeping system. And bank statements with images and canceled checks. I had an attorney ask me, short of a detailed forensic accounting investigation which by the way may be warranted depending on how severe this is she asked me given that I have a limited budget and I know these losses that I see in this case it was a Schedule C they can't be real to this extent it's supporting a family what should I do and I made the suggestion what you can do and I can help you find this data is you can, once you've substantiated the gross sales of the business, you can multiply that by a percentage that that industry has of typical pre-tax income. So you take, you find the percentage in this industry of pre-tax income that normally generates and you multiply that by the sales. And that will give you an adjusted figure for purposes of figuring out what the business should have generated. Probably not something you want to hang your entire case on, certainly if it's going into full-blown litigation. It could certainly help in settlement, which is where a lot of your cases end up. So we dig into ABC Company, and we get lucky. This never happens, but in this case, we're going to make it simple. We find $75,000 of personal expenses in the other deductions, which in this case is line 19. After we examine the general ledger detail or the bank statements, whatever, all those things, we find $75,000 of personal expenses. We're going to remove those from ABC Company, adding to its income. Depreciation greater than CapEx. What the heck is Josh talking about here? These are related concepts for assets with long lives. These can be things like machinery, equipment, automobiles, computers. The IRS has rules for assets with long lives. Depreciation 
is the expense that the IRS allows you to deduct, to write off on these types of assets. Often, the IRS is going to allow you to accelerate the depreciation expense and the deduction faster than what the asset's life is actually used. That use of the life is actually called CapEx or capital expenditures. So when you have a tax depreciation deduction that exceeds your CapEx that's actually required to operate the business, you're going to get distortion. So this may seem abstract, so we're going to drive this home with an example which will make a lot of sense to you. So here's an example. A client buys a $100,000 piece of equipment with a five-year life. This implies CapEx required of $20,000 a year. It's just the $100,000 divided by five. That's what's required to run this business each year in CapEx. Now the client deducts the entire $100,000 in the current year on the tax return using Section 179 and or bonus depreciation. Totally legal. However, you're going to get distortion of $80,000 since the CapEx is only twenty grand. And the depreciation is 100 grand. So 100 less the 20 is the 80 distortion. So the key thing real cash of the business may be $80,000 more than what the tax return shows. So real cash generated. You need to adjust the tax return to get the correct income and value generated by the business. Okay? So we're going to make this easy on ABC Company. One of the difficulties with these tax returns is that depreciation is in several locations on the return potentially. In this case, an ABC company, we have line 14 on the first page of $50,000. We have another $56,000 back here on line 11 of the Schedule K under Section 179. That gives you a total of $106,000 of depreciation on this tax return. Now you dig in, or we work together and figure out that the CapEx required to run this business is only $50,000. So we're going to adjust off the $56,000 as depreciation exceeding the capital expenditures required to run this business. Okay? One of the things you can do is you can request the detailed depreciation schedule for the business over a long time frame. And working with somebody like me, you can figure out what's the average annual spend on capital expenditures needed to run this business. And that will help to smooth out what the CapEx should be over a level time period. You have to be really careful with this, especially on capital intensive businesses manufacturing companies, HVAC companies, farm businesses, businesses that require a lot of equipment and assets to run them, you need to be very careful with the tax return because you're going to get a lot of potential distortion. Loans to shareholders. You have to ask about whether or not a loan on the books that shows between the business and the shareholder is at arm's length. Is it real? Is it documented? If it's not, you could have a disguised distribution. Unrecorded distributions could be cash that went in the owner's pocket without being taxed. And if adding assets together is one of the methods you're using to value the business, which if it's a worth more live than dead business, generally isn't a good idea. But let's say that that is one of the processes that you are going through in the case. You want to make very sure that you don't add an asset that isn't real. So even though you see it on the book, I'm going to explain to you how this works. It's, it's not too tough. On ABC Company, you see $100,000 loans to shareholders. And notice how it went up from 75 to 100. You ask for documentation on this loan. 
you find no documentation. You find no support for it. You find that it's actually an unrecorded shareholder distribution. And so what's going to be done here is we're going to move the $100,000 from loans to shareholder into shareholder distributions because what happened was that money came out and it just wasn't recorded that way. I see this from time to time. I see it from business owners and I see it from their accountants. And the reason why they do it, the reason why they get kind of cute with this is because they don't want to record the taxable event that has occurred for this distribution. Often what has happened is that the shareholder has zero tax basis in their S corporation. So by showing this as a distribution out, it's going to create a taxable event. And so they stick it up there to avoid the tax hit, even though the cash has come out and gone in their pocket. It's money that's come out that's not actually their money in essence. It could be borrowed money. It could be money that, that was not part of what they've contributed overall to the business. And that creates tax. Compensation, distributions, and dividends. You have to understand how much total cash is going in the owner's pocket. The W-2 salary plus the distributions reflect the total cash that's going in the owner's pocket. Distributions on an S-Corp are one place to hide owner cash. It's basically hiding in plain sight, but you have to know where to look for it. The distributions on an S-Corp are going to escape the payroll taxes, Medicare and Social Security. There is a tax incentive to pump up the distributions and pull down the W-2 to avoid the payroll taxes. So let's take a look at this on ABC Company. On ABC, on line 7, C $75,000 of owner compensation. This is compensation to the owner officer. And back here on 16D, there are $89,000 of distributions. So that's total cash that's going in the shareholder's pocket of $164,000, not counting any personal expenses like we talked about before. Through detailed analysis of the industry, information I can get you, salary surveys, industry data, it is determined that the market salary should be $100,000 based on the duties of the shareholder, what they're doing, similar industries. So we're going to adjust the $75,000 up to $100,000. It's going to go up $25,000 because that's a fair market value salary for this position. And we're doing this because they're, they're basically keeping it low to avoid the payroll taxes. That's what they're doing here. Possibly. We'll assume that's what their motivation is. We don't know in this case. A related issue in divorce. The compensation used for support and maintenance went up from $75,000 to $100,000. You need to handle these two issues at the same time. Otherwise, you get what's known as the double dip. Okay? So the business income came down by $25,000, the compensation for support and maintenance went up $25,000. Now you may think, well, why would you mess with that? The key here is that we're also dealing with the value of the business. So we need to get the compensation correct. Okay? Note that the distributions are also on Schedule M2. Back on page five of the S Corporation, there's $89,000. Inventory that's misstated. Understated inventory can understate your income, sometimes significantly. If the business isn't doing a physical count, particularly regularly, you can't rely on the tax return. And an inventory balance that you see that doesn't change is definitely a red flag. There's a couple of things I want to add to this to put a little color on it. Keep in mind that for businesses inventory intensive, the chances that that 
count is correct as of the date that you need it without a third party count, the chances are going to be low. So be really careful there. I would really highly advise you to get a third party independent count of that inventory for the date you need it. So the de date of separation, the date of trial, whatever that is, because it can move the number significantly. Particularly on inventory intensive businesses. So let's go through an example here on ABC. Notice that the inventory balance didn't change from year to year. It was stuck at $118,000. The detailed count shows that an actual inventory should have been $150,000. That's going to raise the inventory up. It's going to drive up the income $32,000. So the difference between $150,000 and $118,000 is going to increase the income of this business $32,000. Conceptually, what's going on here is that they have basically, whether they did it on purpose or on accident, we don't know, is they have expensed off inventory that has not left their warehouse. So it's still being held for sale. But they've taken that $32,000 and they've written it off as an expense, but it's still sitting in their warehouse. So you have to move the inventory back up to where it should be. This is at cost. Okay, so it's inventory items at cost. Within a compressed time frame, where a lot of these tax returns are having to be done in a very quick turnaround time, the chances of accurate inventory balances on these tax returns is very low. There's a lot of pressure to get these tax returns done and into the IRS in a short amount of time. The due date without extension on an S corporation return is March 15th. Now a lot of them do get extended, just keep that in mind. In a lot of cases, it may give you a couple weeks to get these returns done. That's not a lot of time to get detailed information like this accomplished. Excess or appreciating assets. You'd be shocked at what people try to stick inside a business. Maybe you wouldn't, I don't know. You have to watch out for excess and appreciating assets. I'm going to define these. These are assets that are not required to run the operations of the business. They include cash greater than operating needs, commercial or residential real estate. No, that vacation home is not a business asset. Stocks and investments. I've seen all of these things. Often, these assets need to be valued separately and then added to the operating value of the business. They can be huge add-ons to the operating value of the business. I just valued a company that had, had an extra $100,000 of cash in it. And it was cash that had not been taken out. This happens a lot when the owner sees the business checking account as an extension of their personal checking account. They don't see a dividing line there. They see it all the same. This happens a lot. I had a farm return where I valued that, where they had stock that was in the business that probably shouldn't have been there. We had to add the value of that stock, of that business that the farm held to the operating value of the business. So this happens very frequently. So you have to understand what's inside the business that shouldn't, in essence, be there and if it shouldn't be there, you may need to add it to the operating value at the end. Again, another way to find this potentially is to look at the detailed depreciation schedule and see what assets are on the books of this company. So on ABC Company, we're going to keep this simple. They have $170,000 of cash on the books. Our detailed analysis indicates $120,000 is needed to operate the business effectively. The rest is excess. So we're going to remove $50,000 and add that to the operating value of the business we're going to determine later. Conceptually, a way to think of this is imagine you bought an antique car for $50,000. You put it on a trailer, you bring it back to your house. 
You open up the trunk of the car, you find $100,000 in the trunk. What's the total value of that asset? Is it 50 or is it 150? It's 150. So you can't ignore that cash just because it's in excess. You have to add it on. It's not needed to run that business. Just because you stockpiled it doesn't mean it should just sit there and not be part of the value. It has to be added because it's excess. Okay? Putting the red flags together. How much do they impact a case like yours? In income, in value, it is big. Let's take a look. Here's what we adjusted. Here's a summary to refresh your memory. We didn't make any business loss adjustments. Still be very mindful of the business losses that occur. Personal expenses of $75,000, which add to income. Depreciation adjusted to CapEx, $56,000 more income. Loans to shareholders that should have been distributions didn't have an income impact. It's a balance sheet adjustment of $100,000. The compensation went up. The distributions went down by $25,000. Recall that that could impact the income for support and maintenance. You have to handle those issues at the same time. Understated inventory, $32,000 more income. And excess cash, of $50,000, we're going to add that to the operating value of the business. And there's an additional $2,000 of payroll taxes related to the compensation adjustment in five. Here's ABC Company, restated after all the red flag adjustments. This is what could be called a tax return representing economic reality. The true cash generated by the business. Some of the areas we adjusted. The compensation to up to $100,000. So that went up. That made the business income go down. Depreciation kept that study at $50,000. That was the CapEx required to run it. The Section 179, the excess, came off. So that increased the value of the business, increased the income. Deductions. The personal expenses, you'll recall. We found the personal expenses, so that drove the deductions down to 275. More income. So the ordinary business income, you'll recall we started with $5,000. Now it's sitting at $141,000. The Section 179 depreciation is gone. The distributions are higher because of the loans to shareholders went through right here. So they're at 289. Back here on the balance sheet, now the cash came down because we had the excess cash. The inventory went up because they understated it. The loans to shareholders are gone. The accumulated depreciation is down because of the adjustment for the CapEx. And the retained earnings is down. It's a combination of several other adjustments put together. So we have a balancing tax return. Here's what page five looks like now with $141,000 in net income. There's the distributions adjusted. If you are concerned that I fudged the numbers, I promise I did not. I didn't have to. Here is a trial balance showing the debit and credit entries. Debits and credits are an accounting term, if you're not aware of that. We started with $5,000. We ended up with $141,000. That change in income was $136,000 through the adjustments that we went through on the red flags. For clarification, credits are shown as bracketed numbers in this example. That's an accounting convention. That just means that in this case the sales exceed the expenses. So when the credits exceed the debits and the income you get a bracketed number down here. Debits equal credits. We go from 5 to 141. The change was $136,000.
And this still isn't a very profitable business. Only a few percentage points of their sales are actually getting to the bottom line. So 141 is still not an extremely profitable business on $4.2 million of sales. Here's my estimate of the value of the business. Recall we ended up with $141,000 after all the red flag adjustments. We're gonna take income taxes out of that, some working capital requirements. Then after those adjustments, the estimate for ongoing after-tax cash flow is $95,000. I used a 16% capitalization rate to get a value of just under $594,000 before we added on the excess cash of 50. And that took us to a $644,000 value of this business. Not a small number. $644,000 business. Now, what if you just use the tax return as is? How much would that cost your client? Let's say you totally bombed. You went with these numbers as is. The $5,000 of business income as shown on the return, the $75,000 owner compensation as shown on the return, and then you added the equity in the balance sheet to estimate the value of the business, which in this case was came up to $230,000. So after applying an estimated 30% tax rate, I just used 30 across the board for the income piece, you came up with $56,000 of income and a $230,000 business value. So you just went with the unadjusted, you applied a tax rate, said, okay, that's what it is, 56 generating income between the W-2 and the business and a $230,000 value. And you called it a day. Let's say you opened door number two. Let's say you went this route. You used an EBITDA calculation, which is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. It's a rule of thumb without any more analysis. Let's say you use four times EBITDA. You caught the salary adjustment. You decided to go with $100,000. So your numbers were $98,000 on the business income, $100,000 of owner compensation. That resulted on the EBITDA of a $392,000 business value. That was your estimate for the value of the business. This is four times the 98. So summarizing, $139,000 of income after a 30% tax rate and a $392,000 business value higher than the first one. Let's say you worked the red flags. You went through the process. You did all the things that needed to be done. Here are the adjusted numbers after the red flag analysis. Recall, we ended up with $141,000 business income. That was their pre-tax business income. $100,000 of owner compensation. That's pre-tax owner compensation after the adjustment to fair market value and a $644,000 business value. I showed you that in a previous slide. So taking the income and applying the tax rate, that's $169,000 of income and a $644,000 business value. Okay? Highest one so far. So how bad was it? Well, at best, if you picked option number two, which was still incorrect, but you ended up with $30,000 of income left on the table and a quarter million dollars of assets left on the table. That was the, that was the best you did if you used options, option two, okay? In the worst case, if you used option one, you left $113,000 of income on the table and $414,000 worth of assets. Yikes, that's a lot of six-figure numbers. And keep in mind, the income is year after year after year. It repeats. So if you're using that as a basis for support and maintenance, you've undershot it substantially. Now, you may be thinking that's not enough money lost. I'm not sure if that's what you're thinking. If you are, again, I'm just repeating these numbers. 30 grand a year, quarter million dollars of assets. And the worst case scenario 
it was $113,000 every year and $414,000 worth of assets. That's a lot of money at stake for your client, for their family and their future. I want to help you settle these cases. You can get some advice to close this gap for a lot less than $30,000 to $414,000, okay? What your client doesn't know won't hurt them. Well, I'm hoping you're going to know in your heart that you hurt your client and you're going to do the best job you can. Don't horse trade if you don't know what you don't know. This could be a malpractice suit. If I came in later and saw this had occurred, this could be a bad day for somebody. So just understand that if you use shooting from the hip, horse trading as your strategy, it could come back to bite you. And again, I'm really what I'm really hoping is that the fear doesn't scare you, but just sleepless nights and knowing that you didn't do the, do the best job you could. That's that's really what I'm hoping here. None of my businesses are this big. Are you thinking that? None of the ones you work with. Well, business with four million dollars in sales could be only ten to fifteen employees. Remember, we started with a five thousand dollar profit. That's it. That's often what you're going to see. And the same thing could happen on a business with only $500,000 in sales. That's not a very big business. You could have some significant changes, which would still be six-figure income and value changes if the red flag adjustments had been higher on a smaller business. These small companies are big risks for your practice, for your clients. So if your case has a business, you at least need a red flag review. Figure out where you stand. And then if you want to go forward with more analysis, you can always do that. But don't shoot from the hip, please. How can you fix this? Is that a question you're asking yourself? I hope you are. If you are asking how you can fix this, I have the answer for you. Understand that I have the answer a template from 20 years in the trenches to save you a ton of time, to save you a ton of money, to give you confidence, to avoid embarrassing surprises, and to settle your cases quickly, effectively. You can do it yourself and waste hundreds of hours, thousands of dollars, or you can just call me. Your decision is a slam dunk in terms of cost benefit. I want to help you settle these cases. I'm going to give you the tools. In fact, I'm going to show you at the end of this presentation, I'm going to give you my full arsenal of tools in written format. I'm going to show that to you at the, at the end. You're fully able to use that. But if you get stuck, please call me, okay? This is my disclaimer. I have to let you know that your particular factual situation may be much different than this and probably will be. So please just call me. Don't just use these slides and apply them across the board to your cases without some more discussions with somebody that understands all these nuances. I do my best to impart my 21 years of knowledge in an hour-long presentation, but that's tough to do. Nothing you saw today is legal advice. And nothing in this webinar is a conclusion of value or calculation of value under NACVA or AICPA standards. Please understand that. Here's my contact information. 217-649-8794. That's my primary phone. Or you can email me, josh at jhorncpa.com. Go out to my website hornvaluation.com. My CV is there. A list of documents I would need is there. I'm on LinkedIn. Type in Joshua Horn. Follow me on Twitter. Look at me on YouTube under Horn Valuation. Sign up for my blog. Whatever you want to do. 
please write down my phone number or my email address in case you get stuck, okay? I'm happy to take your questions. I want to talk to you. I want to help you. I'm going to put this out on my website. You can get this. You can use this free. You don't even have to talk to me if you don't want to talk to me. Here's my seven red flags of business tax returns expanded in bullet point format. This is four pages long and it covers all of the issues. It's organized as defining the issue, general guidance on the issue, and then your action plan to fix the issue. So I go through all of this here, starting with the business losses, the personal expenses, depreciation and CapEx, loans to shareholders, compensation, distributions, and dividends, misstated inventory, and excess or appreciating assets. Take a look at this. If you don't want to dig down into it further, again, call me and I'll help you through it. I'm going to put this out there as a resource. You can use it in your divorce or litigation cases. I've had a great time with this. I hope you've learned a ton. Let me know what you got out of it. Let me know what else I could do for you. Send me an email, josh at jhorncpa.com. Drop me a text message at 217-649-8794. Pick up the phone. Any of those things will work. Okay? I know you're busy, but if you have challenges in your practice, I want to know about them. Okay? I want to know how I can help. What other materials I can put together to help you. This is Josh Horn CPA of Horn Valuation. Have a great day. Bye-bye.